My name is Akhil Sastry. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I am in private practice out of Atlantic Orthopedics, and I wanted to share some information about robotic knee surgery and hopefully give you a more comprehensive overview of what knee arthritis is and what treatment options are available from non-operative measures to surgical intervention. Okay? But before we start down that path, I'd just like to take a few minutes to recognize some of the people that were able to put this venue together. First, obviously, York Hospital was uh, gracious and kind enough to put this together, so I think we owe them a round of applause. And in particular, Jean, Ashley, and Jody have worked very hard to put these programs together. And obviously, we would not be able to do these outreach programs if they didn't put in the tireless work and effort that it requires to, to, to ultimately collaborate and, and put in all the work and effort that, that is required so that we have an opportunity to interact with our patients in the community. So thank you as well. These are my disclosures. They're not really pertinent uh, to the talk that we're going to uh, speak about today. So in case if you didn't know, either the person sitting next to you or someone in your family member in all likelihood is suffering some, from some form of arthritis. Believe it or not, in the United States as it stands, over 40 million people in the United States have some form of arthritis. And they anticipate that the number is going to increase to 60 million before the end of the decade. And when we talk about arthritis, arthritis is a, is a very genetic category. All arthritis means is that there's cartilage in a particular joint that is worn away. But it doesn't really speak to the different types of arthritis there are. As a matter of fact, when you think of arthritis, there is truly a subcategory of, of how we define and quantify what arthritis is. Osteoarthritis is probably what most of you are all familiar with. That is what we call the wear and tear, and in all likelihood, that is the majority of patients where they're afflicted with that problem, where the cartilage just simply wears away with time, genetic predisposition, or just simply wear and tear characteristics. Other forms of arthritis include rheumatoid arthritis, where you develop an autoimmune disease, and the autoimmune disease starts to attack the normal cartilage within our own body. Then there's post-traumatic arthritis, where if you sustain an injury, whether it was due to a play in high school or whether it was due to a, a recreational game as recently as a few weeks ago, where the cartilage becomes damaged, and then that cartilage damage starts to develop into osteoarthritis, excuse me, post-traumatic arthritis. And the, and the last form of arthritis is something called avascular necrosis, where the blood supply to the cartilage becomes compromised. And if the blood supply to the cartilage becomes compromised, that area starts to develop characteristics where the cartilage wears out. And then subsequently, all of these different forms of arthritis lead to one problem, pain, right? And, and the biggest issue with arthritis, and the reason why we suffer from this particular affliction, is because cartilage does not have the ability to regenerate. And we have yet to figure out a way in the lab to make that cartilage regenerate for uh, extended joints such as the hip, the knee, the shoulder, or the ankle. And when the cartilage does not have the ability to regenerate, if it becomes damaged, regardless of how that happens, that cartilage damage is going to be permanent, and then we subsequently will go on to develop the symptoms that you all are probably familiar with that arthritic patients suffer from. So here's a, a cartoon picture, if you will, of where on the left you've got healthy cartilage which is outlined by white, and then over a period of time, regardless of what type of arthritis affliction that you have, that healthy white starts to disintegrate and you start to develop areas where the cartilage becomes bare. And sometimes we refer to that as bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, if you will. And any time you see an orthopedic surgeon or your primary care physician, once the diagnosis is made, we're always going to recommend non-operative treatment first to see if we can get the pain under control by implementing these measures. And these measures include weight loss, over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medication, physical therapy, and a combination of different injections. And, and sometimes they're extremely effective in controlling the pain. But unfortunately, you know, this is a 
permanent solution, excuse me, this is a temporary solution to a permanent problem, right? So if you look at the statistics, once the diagnosis of arthritis is made in the orthopedic surgeon's office, typically within five years, you end up requiring some sort of surgical treatment. Now part of it is maybe you're seeing a surgeon and they're going to recommend it anyway, but hopefully the reason why they're recommending it is because these measures are no longer effective in controlling your pain. Now the good news is that you're not alone if you end up requiring surgical treatment. As it stands, in the United States in 2010, 400,000 hip replacements were performed, and over 700,000 knee replacements were performed. So if you're sitting in this audience, or if you have a family member or a friend that has this affliction, they are certainly not alone. And they anticipate that these numbers are going to project to even higher rates by the end of the decade. If you look at conservative metrics, they anticipate that there will be over 700,000 hip replacements performed by 2020 and 1.5 million knee replacements. So certainly this problem is not going to go away. The question is, how are we going to effectively address this problem and what are we going to do as, a, as, as surgeons and physicians in the community to evolve our tactics to allow patients to recover more quickly and get the pain under control in a more expedient fashion? So I'm going to bore you guys a little bit. I'm going to give you a quick anatomy lesson. And if you've seen me in the office, there's a very good chance that you've heard the same sort of dialogue uh, that I'm about to give you today. So when I think of the knee, I like to think that of the knee into three compartments. There's an inside compartment called the medial compartment. There's an outside compartment called the lateral compartment. And there's a compartment under the kneecap called the patellofemoral compartment. Each compartment is comprised of, of articular cartilage. So as we had mentioned before, all arthritis tells us is that articular cartilage starts to wear. So if you think of articular cartilage as analogous to tread on a tire, right? When you're born, you've got a full set of tread, and as the tread starts to wear on the tire, the cartilage can start to wear in the joint. And as the tread starts to wear wear, okay, the tire loses, it loses its ability to stay on the road. So similarly, if your cartilage is starting to wear out in the knee in one or more than one compartment, that's one of the reasons we start to walk with a limp. That is one of the one of the reasons why we start to become more reliant on a cane, because the pain becomes harder to bear, and the cartilage loss creates what we call antalgic or compensatory gates, where we shift the way that our muscles are designed to walk to compensate for the pain that is occurring due to the affliction. Now, the conventional approach to say, why in the world are you going to talk to me about partial knee replacement surgery if you just put up a slide that's saying that 700,000 knee replacements are done and 1.5 million knee replacements will be done by the end of the decade? What is the role for partial knee replacement surgery? Well, what, before we talk about partial knee replacement surgery, I think it makes more sense to talk about a full knee replacement surgery because it is more likely that you've either had one or if you, you had a family member that's had one. So typically, what a total knee arthroplasty entails is when you have cartilage loss in more than one of those compartments that I described to you before, okay, you, have, you want to undergo a full knee replacement simply because if you replace the cartilage loss in one component of the knee, the other two parts of the knee that have already lost the cartilage, if you leave it alone, you're going to continue to get symptomatic pain associated with that area. So if you have cartilage loss in two or more compartments, the better and more proper operation would probably be a knee replacement. And we have done remarkable things with knee replacements as far as pain control and rehab is concerned really over the last five to seven years. So if you look at it, if you look at the Medicare metrics, the length of stay in the United States is 3.3 days. So I think in the Seacoast area we've done a pretty good job of beating those metrics where patients are allowed to go home more quickly, perhaps even one or two days after surgery. One of the reasons why we're able to do that is because the pain regimens have really evolved over the last five years. So now we can implement a combination of different medications that are not narcotic based to get the immediate surgical pain under control. 
And if you get that immediate surgical pain under control, it will allow you to function at a higher level and allow you to get back to activities more quickly. But what doesn't change with the total knee replacement and what hasn't changed with the total knee replacement over the past seven to 10 years are the parts are the same size, the surgical dissection is exactly the same, and you do have to violate the muscle and the tendon in front of the knee in order to gain access to all three compartments before we replace them, okay? And typically, the return to work scenario for most patients who undergo a total knee replacement is about six weeks. It will take about three to six months for you to fully recover and rehab from the, the replacement. And what most patients have told me is it really takes for about a year before it starts to feel quote unquote normal, okay? And I think the reason why it takes so long for it to feel normal and why patients even after a year, although they have excellent pain relief and function, it still feels different than what their native knee feels like is simply due to the fact that when you do a full knee replacement, not only is the cartilage replaced, but the two crucial ligaments that are, are, are critical for rotational stability, the anterior crucial ligament, typically called the ACL, or the posterior crucial ligament called the PCL, has been supplanted by the implant. So now the implant is taking on the role and function of what those ligaments used to do. So I think that's one of the reasons why patients describe it as, although the pain relief is good, the range of motion is good, the strength is good, it doesn't just quite feel as natural. Now, the survivorship for knee replacement is actually ac excellent. If you look at papers that have been written from places like uh, University of Chicago at Rush at the Hospital for Special Surgery, these large orthopedic institutions have done great multi-center uh, studies that look at survivorship of these knee replacements, and they seem to function well in 92% of cases of up to 15 years. The other good news for the knee replacement, not so much for the patient, but more for the surgeon, is you can malposition the implant, not intentionally, I hope, but unintentionally, if you malposition the implant for up to five degrees, there is no difference in clinical outcome. And that was a study that was done at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where they went back and looked at all the x-rays that they had done from 1990 to now, and they said, how are the patients doing when the x-rays don't look so hot? And it actually didn't make a whole lot of difference. And I think the reason why is because the implants encompass the entire portion of the bone, so there is some flexibility, if you will, for not putting the implant in perfectly. But I don't think that any surgeon intentionally is going to put it in the wrong spot, obviously. So what a partial knee entails is we're just simply replacing one compartment. So your own anterior cruciate ligament and your own posterior cruciate ligament are going to continue to function at the level that they've been accustomed to doing for years and decades as they were before, okay? You can actually do this operation as an outpatient surgery, which is really nice. The reason why we can get away with that is we can still implement all of the pain tactics that we were using for a total knee, but now because the surgical dissection is less, because the surgical scar is less, and because it's going to feel more natural at an earlier rate, patients are able to transition from a single cane or, a, or two canes immediately after the surgery, and within two to four weeks, they can start independently walking and driving, and within six weeks, it starts to feel really good. The other advantage is, not only is it a smaller scar, because the surgical dissection is less and because it's going to start to feel more natural more quickly, you can get back to going to work at an earlier clip. Now, the interesting thing is, if partial knee replacement surgery is a good option, out of the 700,000 knee replacements that are being done annually, how come only 60,000 partial knee replacements are being done? Well, I have a very good, that's a very good question in case if you were wondering, all right? So, the question is why? Is it because more than one compartment is involved? Well, actually, there's a group of orthopedic surgeons based out of London, England, that looked at symptomatic osteoarthritis patients and tried to categorize based on x-ray and physical exam 
of whether or not a partial knee replacement will serve them well or a full knee replacement will serve them well. And they found that 50% of patients actually suffer from cartilage loss in only one compartment. So in theory, if that study is correct, okay, at the very least, out of the 700,000 knee replacements that are being performed, at least 250 to 300,000 of them should at least be a partial knee replacement, you would think, right? So the question is, well, if it's not due to the fact that the number of patients aren't there, is it an issue of survivorship? You know, the easy response for a surgeon is to say, well, they won't last as long. Well, let's look at the data and see if that's actually true. The Oxford group, who does more partial knee replacements than any other group in the entire world, looked at their survivorship and compared it to total knee replacements, okay? They looked at 15-year outcome studies. So as I said to you before, the 15-year outcome studies for total knee replacement was 92%. For a partial knee replacement, it was 88%. So I don't necessarily think we can hang our hat on that as a logical explanation, if you will, of, of the reason of why we're not doing them. The other question to ask is, well, even if we're taking out less bone, even if we're doing less surgical dissection, maybe patients are simply not happy with the partial knee replacement. Maybe they're happy with the total knee replacement. Again, there's actually a great study to look at that. Someone actually put the time and effort to evaluate whether or not patients are doing better with one versus another. If you look at patient satisfaction scores for a partial knee replacement, it is 91%. If you look at total knee replacement, it is 65%. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the knee replacement is not functioning well, but I do think that simply due to the, to the ergonomics of how the implant functions versus how the native knee functions, that difference, if you will, creates a sensation where it just doesn't feel the same. And I just think that patients are not going to be as happy, if you will, with a full knee versus a partial knee. Now, the interesting thing is, I do way more total knees than partial knee replacement surgery. But I, I think it's important to understand and to critically look at what people are telling us when they come back to the office. Those same 65% who, who said that they were satisfied with their knees, 80-something of them would redo it. So it's not that they wouldn't do the operation because they're still having terrible pain associated with the arthritis, but it just doesn't feel the way that they thought it would feel compared to what it was like before the surgery and after the surgery, okay? And I think that is something where as collectively as surgeons we can improve on that and perhaps this might be the better way to do it. So since we know that partial knee replacements have been performed since the 1980s, we can't use that old logic that this is quote unquote new, and this is a gimmick or a trick or some sort of uh, you know um, co commercial way to say ah this is a, a great procedure but it's sort of a, a, a switch and bait phenomenon. That's not really what's happening here. We know the survivorship is great. We know the patient satisfaction is great. We know that 40 to 50 percent of the patients actually qualify for this operation, right? But the simple reason of why I think that most surgeons don't opt for a partial knee replacement is because it's technically more difficult to put in correctly than compared to a full knee replacement. Now, as I said to you before, that you can accept the malposition of a knee replacement for up to five degrees, and the patient will do just as well as the person who had it perfectly done. But with a partial knee replacement, you cannot miss by more than one or two degrees. So that relative accuracy compared to the two operations is something that's going to shy the surgeon away from doing the surgical procedure, even though it may be the better operation and better surgical choice for that particular individual. And I think that where we need to start and where we need to look at is something called instrumentation. So what instrumentation in orthopedics means is when we're trying to decide on how to cut the bone and what angle to cut the bone, we utilize these special instruments in the operating room to position them in the angle that we think it's going to be prior to making those cuts, okay? So if you look at a partial knee replacement or a full knee replacement, it's two-dimensional. So when we do that, we look at it from the front, we look at it from the side, and we rely on our surgical experience to make the proper cut. 
And 92 to 95 percent of the time, we'll get it right. Because if you look at that situation of up to five degrees of mouth to mouth position, that's pretty consistent with what we would say that our eyeballs experience and two dimensional instrumentation will give us. But the problem is, we live in a 3D world. It's like bringing in, how many of you guys are familiar with AAA, right? So, so 20 years ago, if you were going to drive to Canada, if you were going to go to Montreal or to Quebec, you'd go to your AAA and you'd pick up the trip tech and you'd get the orange or the yellow highlighter and figure out how you go from A to B. And that was perfectly appropriate. Now, how many of you guys today have a smartphone? This is about everybody, right? So if you're going somewhere, is anybody going to go to, go to AAA to pick up a trip tech? Uh, so I, the instrumentation that we use in orthopedics hasn't changed since the mid-80s. So in this three-dimensional world that we live in, I really think that computers and robotics are going to allow us to see things that we simply could not appreciate from the views that we have with the current instrumentation that's available. And I think that robotic surgery is absolutely going to be the future. So that's where macroplasty comes in. What MAKO does is it allows us to get a perfect 3D mapping of the individual's knee. So for example, you come in, you fail your non-operative treatment, we establish that you've got arthritis over one portion of the knee, we take a CT scan of your knee and create a three-dimensional model. What that three-dimensional model will allow us to do is it will allow us to simulate where the parts on the knee bones go, even before you come to the operating room. So we'll know the exact size, we'll know the position that we want to put the knee, uh, the place in, because the 3D mapping allows us to look at the knee from the front, from the side, from the top down, from the bottom up, and from back to front. Simply something that cannot be achieved by the human eye. Okay? So that allows us to, to get the sizing so perfectly that it's essentially going to be like a hand in a glove. The second thing that happens is, since we already know the sizes and we already know the position that we want to put the parts in, even before you come into the operating room, after you come into the operating room, what we'll do is we'll put these pins in your bones that are attached to sensors that couple it to the robotic arm. So that recreates the 3D model of the knee that we simulated the operation on a week before on the, based on your CT scan. So before we even we make a cut into the bone, the computer screen will allow us to position the parts into the knee bone and bring the knee through a range of motion and it will tell us to the one millimeter and one, less than one degree of accuracy if we put the parts at the specific positions that we thought were appropriate for you, what it would look like on a graph. And if we like it, we'll take it. If we don't like it, even before we make a bone cut, even if before we rely on what our eyeballs will tell us, even before we rely on the 2D instrumentation, we can simply reposition the parts so that we can essentially reestablish the range of motion from 0 to 120 degrees and make it within less than one millimeter and one degree of accuracy. And I'm going to show you a video to give you an idea of what it is. Now the other thing is even though the robotic arm is a crucial part of this operation, the robot is not doing the procedure. And I'm not on my iPhone on the side just making sure that the robot's hanging out and doing its job. What the robotic arm does is it's a high definition navigation tool. So that robotic arm allows us to map out the parameters of where the cartilage loss is, and it allows us to take out the specific cartilage that has been lost at the parameters that the surgeon has set. And the robotic arm will not allow us to deviate from those parameters. So that's what it is. So the surgeon is controlling the arm. We're not sitting up by the side checking our phone. <laughs> so this is an overview, if you will, of how it works. So that's what the robotic arm does. So to kind of walk you through this one more time. So that's what the machine looks like, and those are the two computer animation models that we will use. Do you actually program that, or is there a tech that does it? No, we, we, we set the plan before. 
but there is someone that runs the robot with us. It's almost like if you think of the analogy as being at a at an airport, there's a control tower guy saying that these are the records you set. Do you like it? Do you want to change it? So it's a constant dynamic evolution as you're doing the procedure. <coughs> So those are the different types of partial knees you can do. If you have cartilage loss on either the medial or the lateral or underneath the kneecap, and the other portions of the knee are, are normal, you simply just replace that portion of the knee. Excuse me. Uh, I'll tell you, the, yeah, so the, repart the replacement parts are actually made out of the same types of material that they are for a total knee. The metal parts are always made out of cobalt chrome. <coughs> Because pearl, cobalt foam is something that you can cement into place. Okay? So, knee parts are always cemented into place. Although that is evolving, the biomaterials are significantly improving. So, we're going to be able to do something called press fit implants where you don't need to put cement in anymore and the body will grow onto it like we do for the hip. But that's probably two to five years away. So, again, what this is showing you is that dynamic evolution. So, if we put the, it's telling us if we put the parts into place, you see that graph? That is telling us that it's either too tight or too loose. So before we meet a bone cut, all we're doing on the bottom right screen is changing the position of the implant without actually cutting into the bone. <coughs> and it will tell us how that range of motion is tracking, if it's in the perfect center center position, and that graph will outline how the alignment looks on the body. So this is the actual area where once we've established that the cartilage <laughs> loss is in that area, once we've set the parameters of the implant, we simply just take out the diseased cartilage with the burr, just like you would for a partial knee replacement. But here, there will also be a computer screen in addition to where the cartilage is being taken out. And that computer screen where you saw the green is just like a five-year-old coloring in the lines. We want to stay within the lines of, of so where the parts fit in absolutely perfectly for each patient. Uh, sure, lots. Can I? Um, can you do more than one part of the knee Sometimes. at the same time? Uh, you could, uh, but I think depending on the type of disease involvement there is, um, probably not the best thing to do. So if you had kneecap arthritis with one of the other parts of the knee, then yes. But if you had medial and lateral, then no. And the reason why is that when you lose cartilage loss on the inside part of the knee, the leg bows in. If you end up using cartilage loss on the outside part of the knee, the leg bows out. So if you have cartilage loss where it's on both sides, but one area is pulling to one side versus the other, putting it in it separately in each part won't correct for the alignment properly. So, so the benefits of, of doing a robotic assisted partial knee replacement is that it's a smaller incision, it's muscle sparing, only the arthritic portion is resurfaced. The implants allow us to optimally position it so that it's a smooth range of motion. And it's really not that new. It's fairly new to our area, for sure. We're the first ones to do it in the first ones to do it in the Seacoast. But there have been 50,000 that have been done since 2006. And their survivorship is 99%. So clearly they're working very well at 10 years. And if you look at the satisfaction scores, like I said to you before, they're far superior to a total knee. The revision rates tend to be lower at at least the two-year and ten-year follow-up, but obviously at 15-year follow-up, you won't know that yet. And it's two to three times more accurate than utilizing two-dimensional imaging. And now that's all the questions you want. <laughs> So the hope is the hope is that uh, the parts would even last longer than 15 years. So you can maybe get 20 to 25 years out of it. Recovery won't change. If anything, the surgical time goes down, right? Because when you put cement in, it's just like putting cement outside. If you've ever worked on the pavement or done any cementing in the house, you got to wait for the cement to dry. So the surgeon has to do the same thing, whether it's a full knee or a partial knee, we have to wait for the cement to dry. So if we had biologic implants where we could put them in, once it's in, it's done, and we don't have to wait for the cement to dry, but 
that recovery outcome surgical incision that won't change. It will be exactly the same. Uh, we've done about a dozen so far, and um, let's see. But I've done probably about 200 plus partial knee replacement surgeries. So when you look, at the, what's that? No, that's no, no, no. So, so, so the robotic knee has only been available in the state of Maine since January. Okay. So partial knee surgery has been around since the 1980s, like I told you. So I've done. 200 plus partial knee replacements, and I've done probably anywhere from 1,600 to 2,000 total joint replacements since I've been in practice. So the principles of a partial knee replacement to a robotic knee are the same. The only difference is the robotic knee allows me to see the back of the knee and the front of the knee and from top to down and bottom to top. So it's not going to affect my ability to do the surgical procedure. It's just going to improve my accuracy that a human eye simply can't recreate. What's that? Well, it's harder to keep track, but yes, some, I have probably between 1,600 and 2,000 total joint replacements. Yes. Is that a question? Yeah. I had a total knee replacement about a year and a half ago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, if, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Yates, I'd love to use the first one to have it, actually, say to me. Uh, so, so I just want, I thought it would be nice to for him to share his experience and, and give us an idea of why he did it and a few regrets. I'm not a doctor here, but uh, we did this. Uh, I can't hear you. We did this January 20th on Monday. And uh, it's been a great experience. Every day was easier and easier to uh, get through the therapy. You noticed a big change every day. It got easier, less painful. Uh, started out on pain pills of oxycodone, and I was taking two of those every four hours for the first two weeks. And it gradually cut back. <coughs> and, uh, I would go six hours and eight hours, then I'd go one a day, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, six weeks, six weeks, six weeks now, uh, feeling great. Is this fully or robotic? Partially. Yeah. Robotic partial? Right. Yes, because I was the first one that Dr. Sasser did the robotic in the state of Maine. And uh, completely happy with it. I injured my knee back in 1984 when I was in the Army and uh, living with it all this time. It got to the point where I had to do something. I was limiting my activities because of the pain I was feeling. So it, uh, it was a good time to do it. It's a great question. Um, believe it or not, once, thank you so much. Um, it's a great question. It actually takes me less time to do a robotic knee than a conventional partial knee. So when I do a conventional partial knee, it takes about um, an hour and a half. For the robotic partial knee, it takes about four to five minutes. <coughs> Full knee probably takes me a little less time than a partial knee, so probably about 30 to 40 minutes before I close it. But then you gotta understand, like most total joint surgeons who do a fair number of surgical volume, they're gonna they're gonna be able to it, it's not how quickly you do it. You know, it's how long it lasts and how well the patients do. I don't think, I think if you look at, a, at an appropriate question in terms of having negative outcomes, which is more important, if surgeries end up taking greater than two hours, that is when you could potentially run into surgical complications. I don't think it's really that important if you do it in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, or an hour and a half. The key is you want to get it in, you want to get it in right, and you want to make sure that the alignment is perfect. And that is in all likelihood going to yield the best result. Well, physical therapy, the yeah, so the physical therapy is in half, would you say? Because are you done physical therapy at this yeah, point? Yeah, I did uh, one week of uh, home PT. Home, and home visits. And they came in twice during that week. And then I went for the next three weeks twice a week. And every time I went, I was getting two to three degrees more of motion. Just by doing the exercises and stuff that they give me, the stretching exercises. 
and as the swelling went down, it got easier, less painful. It, uh, so I would say on, on average, you can feel most people. On average, if you look at most papers, the, the therapy, the rehab amount is cut by half or a third. So it's pretty substantial if you look at it to conventional. The other advantage is you don't need to use a machine to bend and straighten your knee. The CPM machine, there's no real advantage of doing that. Uh, so in terms of, of, of that is also is beneficial. Yeah? Do each of the compartments have the same recovery rate or are some faster than others? It's a great question. I would say that the uh, one under the kneecap would probably take the longest simply because the surgical dissection is just a little bit more involved. But if it's either the medial or lateral compartment, it shouldn't matter. Because the soft tissue dissection is the same. Yeah. Well, the limitations, I would say, you know, common sense for the first four weeks. You know, I don't want you to uh, uh, start doing 300 pound squats. It's probably not a good idea. I think for the first four weeks, regardless of which type of surgery you do, you want to make sure the incision is healing, the swelling is down. But I, I, I kind of loosen the reins after about a month to six weeks. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ann. Uh, Ten years ago, I had a total knee replacement done. And uh, three weeks ago tomorrow, Dr. Satch performed a, a partial knee replacement. And the two experiences were like night and day. Uh, my mobility is just incredible compared to 10 years ago. And I remember coming home from the hospital and rehab, and I think I was under house arrest for about, <laughs> about two weeks before I could go out. It was a little confining. Um, but anyway, yeah, it, it, it's a wonderful experience. My mobility is just incredible. Pain is there. And I think it's really naive to go into any sort of procedure like this and say it's going to be pain-free. I think you have to acknowledge that, and, and we want to just dismiss it. But it will be there. But every day, every day, it gets better and better. Thank you. Pardon? Same knee different knee? Yeah. No, different knee. No, this is the one. This is the old one. <laughs> Sure. So, so you know, obviously, we, we go through the non-operative measures. X-rays are really important. That's probably the, uh, the the critical factor in determining whether or not you'd be a good candidate. I think that's probably the, the number one factor after non-operative measures are, are no longer effective. So, an answer would be definitive. Whether yeah, usually, rarely will end up requiring an MRI if something's a little off. Uh, but more often than not, X-rays usually tell the story. If someone had their ACL. That's even more reason to do it because you need an intact ACL for a partial knee to work. So, so in all likelihood, uh, if the ACL is intact, then that's great. Then, then it would work reasonably well as long as the cartilage loss is limited to one one zone, if you will. Is there a cost difference between the total and the No. If anything, it's probably I would imagine it would be cheaper because. I, I don't know the specifics. From our standpoint, we actually get uh, less if we do a partial than a full. But patients do better. So. Yeah? I had a partial knee replacement at York Hospital nine years ago. At that time, I was told that I would be, because I had a partial, I would be eligible for two knee replacements, full knee replacements on the same knee. Does that still hold or does that change? I'm sorry, I, I don't know that's the specific answer. It kind of depends on, on your x-ray and why and so on and so forth. Yeah. I'm not sure, like, even know what que the question is, but uh, how does the meniscus fit into this story? Yeah, great question. Uh, so the meniscus it are, are two disc-shaped structures between the two bones, the femur and the tibia. So, you know, I always think of the meniscus cartilage as shock absorbers in a car. So the top bone drives down to the bottom bone. It's the meniscus that gets rid of the force across the knee joint. Uh, if you have an isolated meniscus tear, 
you don't need any type of replacement. That is not the proper surgical operation. If you have a concomitant meniscus tear with arthritis, the worse the arthritis, arthritis is, the less likely you will improve with just meniscus surgery. So it is not appropriate to do surgery for a meniscus tear with underlying arthritis in the same compartments. Does that help? Does well, that I was told that my meniscus is not only torn, but a lot of it's missing or gone. Sure. Or, and uh, so what kind of procedure? It would, this wouldn't work for that kind of a problem? No, I'm not saying that. It's a separate problem. So if you have had a meniscus tear, and if you've had surgery for a meniscus tear, and you went on to develop arthritis in that compartment, then yes, you would qualify to have that operation done, assuming the other parts of the knee are normal. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious about what material actually serves. Yeah. So, so to just give you, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll be happy to give you a little bit of a background of joint replacement surgery. So, so the, you know, there's a guy named, uh, you guys have heard of John Charnley? He actually got knighted for his work for orthopedics. He's an orthopedic surgeon from London, England. And what he was trying to do is he was principally a hip surgeon. And at the time, in the 60s, there was not really a good surgical option for patients who had arthritis. So he did something that probably would never pass today, but he decided to do a hip replacement surgery with a material called Teflon. So the Teflon was in an inner material, so that seemed to make sense. And he put the parts into place. He did a hundred of them, okay? The problem is Teflon is very brittle and it can scratch. So within a year, all 105. So it would have never passed today's IRB. So then he went back to the drawing board, and he had a fantastic lab. So there was an engineer in his lab that was tinkering around with a material called polyethylene. Polyethylene is a type of plastic, okay, that is also inert, that does not create uh, a local soft tissue reaction. So at that point, dentists were already cementing in parts for the teeth. So he wanted to know if you could actually cement in a polyethylene and cement in a stainless steel type of construct into the hip. And that was sort of why the first hip replacement was done in 1968. And if you needed, if you wanted to learn how to do hip surgery, you actually had to spend a year with John Charnley in London. And the first one in the United States was done by, I don't know, pictures named Mark Coventry at Mayo Clinic. So the reason why I'm giving you that boring backdrop story is that certain materials like stainless steel and cobalt chrome work very well in cement because they're hard, but they don't scratch. Materials like titanium, which is essentially what we do for all hip replacements now, by the way, are very soft and very porous so the body can generate bone cells and latch onto the implant. We've tried to use titanium type of materials in a knee replacement, and really, we haven't been very successful because the hip is in something called compression. It's really hard to explain, but the hip is in compression and, and bone grows in compression. The knee under, undergoes a lot of stress and rotational stress, so the body has a harder time healing bone cells and latching onto a prosthesis when it's under rotational stress. So those implants are better off being cemented. So if you have to cement the part into place, cobalt chrome has been an excellent material that's been around since the mid-1970s, and they've had a shelf life of 20 plus years. So the only thing that they're now tinkering around with is, is there a way to make the undersurface titanium and the outside still cobalt chrome so the body can still grow into it, and we don't have to redo them in 15 or 20 years? and still get the benefits of that hard material of the forces. And that kind of bore you, but it's a little different. Is, is there, uh, I understand that 3D printing is some kind of tissue? Yeah. Well, essentially that's what the robot does, right? It creates a 3D mapping of the knee. 
So the advantage of doing uh, a robotic knee versus uh, conventional 3D mapping, like a, another company called Conformis does it, it's a static evaluation, right? So we have the 3D printing, but we've already predetermined the sizes, and what's done is done once you're in the operating room. You can't go back. This one, you can still modify it based on the range of motion, so we can dynamically evaluate the knee. So it's almost like taking 3D printing to the next level, right? So it's you implementing that technology, and it's just taking it one step further. As a matter of fact, the robotic arm should have total knee replacement software available by hopefully the end of this year, if not early next year. FDA has approved it in 2015, and there are four centers in the United States that are, as now, trialing them to make sure that the instrumentation is going to be good to go. So it wouldn't surprise me at all within three to five years of most surgeries for me, whether or not it's full or partial, are going to be done robotically. Great. Do you have students redo the replacement early on? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, I'm talking about the knee replacement. You don't have to do it. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Um, so I do a fair number. I probably do more revisions than anybody in the area, unfortunately. So what a revision surgery is, is if the replacement doesn't work well, whether it's been in there too long, or whether the alignment was not great to begin with, and the patient is having problems with it, we have to take out those parts and redo them with something called revision parts. So um, that surgery is probably the, diff the most difficult orthopedic surgery to recover and rehab from. So hopefully, most people won't need to have that done. And we're doing partial robotic knee replacement, correct? Pro well, they have to, I don't know, by the end of this year or the next year, it's not, it's not a matter of not wanting to, it's, um, what's that? No, the approval's already there. They're, 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 do, they're doing pilot testing, but I think they want to do somewhere between three to 5,000 live case studies before they have a national release. So they've done thousands already. So it's not, it's again, it's uh, more of a, a company decision than anything else. They already have the patents and approvals. Yeah? Uh, your schematic showed uh, your Underneath your patella, a pad, a white pad that it rocks on. The knee rocks on. There's a pad there. I think that's what you've been talking about on the revision. What is the life of that pad? Do you oh, the line? It? Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. So, the you're talking about the plastic polyethylene liner that yeah. that serves as the barrier between the two bones. Yeah, those actually have done exceptionally well. They've been improved upon, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. So the shelf life for those liners are, are usually about 20 years. So they're quite good. Second question. Nothing to do with you. But in the last, last year, there was a kind of a tempest in Boston over what is called concurrent surgery. Oh, yeah. Sure. Would you care to address that? Well, it's not applicable to us, right? I don't have a fellow, and I don't have a resident, so I do all my operations with my PA, so it's not really applicable in this case. So with, you're talking about the, the issue with the, uh, the surgeon that had a problem in Boston? Yeah, they had a yeah. So, so what that is, is when you're doing your training in <laughs> residency or fellowship after you complete medical school, there's a supervising surgeon that's supposed to oversee the residents and fellows that are looking. I'm sure you guys have watched like Scrubs, Grey's Anatomy, all that other kind of right? So something, not really similar, but something like that. Um, and it sounds like the, the gentleman wasn't in the room. So I don't, it doesn't really apply to community-based medicine simply because we're all private practitioners. We don't have residents and fellows that work under us, so it's not applicable. Yeah, Mass, mass General was refusing to give disclosure to the patient. Oh, that's, that's what I read in the Boston Globe. 
Yeah. Uh, what's the success rate of a re revised total need? Depends on why we're revising it. Um, if it's the parts are failing and they're loose, they're very good. They're probably 87 to 92%. Um, but you know what? Anytime that you have surgery, the more dissection, the more bone loss, the more the, the surgeon has to work to redo, redo parts or, or redo things, the less it's going to feel like your own. I mean, I think that God or, or evolution, whatever you believe, gave you is going to be vastly superior than what any human being can create, at least at this point. So the more we try to to take out and redo, it's appropriate in certain cases, but it's not going to feel natural. Yeah? Um, the partial knee replacement, you're talking about replacing cartilage on a portion of the knee. Correct. After that's done, what happens if you lose the cartilage on the other two sections of the knee? Then you have to do another partial, or at that point, you can retotal it? It's a good question. It depends. Um, it depends on how long it's been in. So if it's it's been in for a long time, 15 or 20 years, and the cement is starting to fail, then you're better off having a full knee, right? Because that one's not working well anymore, possibly. If you're developing cartilage loss in the other part of the knee, but the partial is functioning fine and there's no problem, then, yeah, you, you could potentially have a partial done on the other side as well. Yeah? Only for me in uh, 20 days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not wait. Uh, this is, this is, uh, let's do it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just explain a little bit about the pain monitor that you said guys in two or two days. Yeah, so, so pain control is probably one of the, the vast improvements that we've had over the last two to five years. I think that you know, local papers have written about it recently. Um, the, the big advantages are, are, are a combination of two things. One is something called uh, an adductor nerve block. Fancy words to say that the front of the knee should be nice and numb for six to ten hours after the operation. So that immediate post-op surgical pain will be significantly diminished. So that's, that's a real nice advantage. Second advantage, and I think this is the reason why knee replacements are able to go home now compared to 10 years ago, is we have a medication that's called x -Borel. It's It's uh, a lidocaine molecule that's encompassed with a fat molecule that allows the lidocaine to, to locally elute in the soft tissue area for 24 to 72 hours, which is the greatest amount of surgical pain that typically patients experience. So that surgical pain that was very difficult to tolerate five, six, seven, eight years ago is now something that people are able to have a much better handle on. So that, that those are the benefits compared to doing it where it was before. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, if you look at, you know, where I operate, at least Portsmouth Hospital and York Hospital, York Hospital and Portsmouth Hospital, um, <laughs> the number of patients that are that are, that are discharged home after a hip and knee replacement, I mean, you're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, it's absolutely the best it's ever been in 10 plus years. I mean, it's remarkable. And I think the principal advantages are surgical technique for hip replacement side for the anterior approach. I mean, you've had talked to anybody who's had an anterior hip done compared to a posterior hip. I mean, everyone says it's, it's night and day, and we, can't, we have recovery so much faster. And the second advantage is this, that the pain control immediately after the surgery is markedly better. We used to give patients just narcotics and nothing else. And now we have a plethora of medications and local injections that we can implement after the operation is done. So these major surgeries are, are so much better tolerated that, you know, as, as this young lady had addressed before, going into any type of operation, it's an unrealistic expectation to think you're going to have no pain. It's simply not possible, right? But if you compare it to what it was like as recently as five plus years ago, there's a market improvement in techniques and hopefully we'll continue to evolve and, and, and even get better. And I think maybe this is, these, these are one of the steps that the hospital is taking to improve those measures.
that nerve block, does it still immediately dissipate? That one minute it works and the next minute, poof, it's gone? No, you're talking about a pump or a pain ball pump. That's not, no, no, no. right? Nerve block just before the surgery, and you're fine for 8, 10, 12 hours, oh, okay. and then immediately it's gone and you are in excruciating pain. Uh, hopefully not, because during that interval of, of 6 to 10 hours, you're going to get a combination of different medication that should at least diffuse some of that pain once the nerve block wears out. Because that, yeah, because they were supposed to try to expedite that it. it didn't, that it lasted a little longer, and it wasn't literally like flipping a switch. It is, it's, it's Are you talking about your personal experiences every Sunday? That's correct. Yeah, I, I don't know specifically. Yeah, it's a nerve block, and then one minute you're fine, and the next minute it's gone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you, I had it. It wasn't you know, cut off. My pain on a scale of one cut was never more than four. Oh, this was unbelievable. You know, it, it really was not a lot of pain. Every once in a while, you, once you, while you move just right and get a spike. Yeah. 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 But on, on the whole, it was about a four. First off, I'd like to thank you for the surgery. I had it three weeks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Three weeks, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'm up and walking. I've been driving for two days. Three days, actually. And as far as the pain goes, I'm going to say that I really didn't have any pain. I had discomfort. And that was it. And I only took two days for it to take for your exercises and everything, I was out of the hospital in less than 24 hours. Right. Wonderful. Is that partial? Bold. 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 Like I said, mo remember, it's the 50 50, so a lot, a lot, of, I won't deviate. And that's probably one of the reasons why I do so many more total knees than, than partial knees. I think part of getting an excellent out outcome is the surgeon owes it to the patient to recognize what the affliction is, to make a proper diagnosis, and to set appropriate expectations so that as they go through the process, they're going to have a really good outcome. Just because I, I don't, but hypothetically, if I want to do a total knee, if I want to do a partial knee, I can't on a capricious notion decide that the next person that's going to come through the door, that is the operation that they're going to get. So it's not appropriate. So I think if you don't extend your indications, you're going to have great outcomes. And if the partial means the correct operation, the statistics bear it out, you will have a better outcome than a total knee in the beginning. But if a total knee is the appropriate operation, and if the cartilage loss is extensive, you will still have a very good outcome. But in the beginning, it's going to be a little harder. Did you put in the knee? Knee pad. Thank you. Yes, because you didn't talk about you yeah, no, exactly. in the general okay. audience, but typically when you do a knee replacement, you do redo the kneecap. Yes. Well, a full knee replacement yeah. always gets a new kneecap. But I don't know specifically about you, but I always do it 100% of the time. I can actually see it for the first time in years. Okay. Thanks again for your time.